which is hosting the world's largest gathering of the men and women who organize the world's top sporting events. They're here to discuss everything from the Olympics to sponsorship and how money is changing the game. Also coming up this week, can a camel provide the cure? How a new discovery in the Emirates could save thousands of lives in Africa. Lebanon welcomes its first motor show in six years, but will rising taxes force more shoppers to buy second-hand instead? The man with the Midas touch. We meet the person behind one of the region's biggest jewellery empires. And Abu Dhabi is making a lot of noise about becoming a cultural hub, but can it be taken seriously? It's not a show off. In Abu Dhabi, we have a very, very clear agenda, very clear strategy that we are promoting arts and culture, and we are building up also education. In many parts of Africa and Asia, a snake bite can mean the loss of a limb or even death. Antidotes are notoriously volatile and extremely sensitive to the heat. But a project right here in the Emirates could change all that. Scientists are using camels to develop an antivenom that you can carry around with you in your pocket. And that could save thousands of lives, as Philip Hampshire has been finding out. There are some jobs that just wouldn't appear on most people's top ten list of occupations they'd like to do. Professor Rolf Schuster has one of them. He helps look after the snakes at Dubai's Central Veterinary Research Laboratory, and he makes sure he's very careful when he's around them. Yeah, they are very dangerous. Uh, I'm very careful. I don't touch them with my hand. If you are bitten by this uh, kind of snakes, uh, you will have a medical problem at least for three, four weeks, yeah, ending up in a hospital under intensive care. 30,000 people a year in Africa die from snake bites, and those are just the recorded figures. There, even getting to intensive care can be an issue. And if you make it, you'd better hope that the notoriously fragile cure hasn't been denatured by the hot African sun. That's where the CVRL's interest in snakes lies. They're giving snake venom to camels in small doses until they build up a resistance. Camels are naturally adapted to the heat. And when their antibodies are extracted, they're so resilient you can carry them in your pocket without the need for refrigeration. The project is all run by Dr Ulrich Wernery in conjunction with the University of Liverpool. We thought it would be a good idea with this new technology, especially that these antibodies does not, do not need to have be cooled, that we can help these people in Africa. So we have now produced, today more or less, the first uh, anti-serum against uh, the spitting cobra. We have produced uh, poly antivenom. We have combined four of the most deadly snakes in Africa together into one shot and injected it to one camel. We hope that with these four snakes, four antivenom, we can treat uh, people, for example, who could not identify the snake who, which has bitten them. The team are gearing up for large-scale production if the project's a success in the field. It's hoped initially the anti-venom provided by these camels will help save lives right the way across Africa. But eventually, they plan to expand the program, possibly saving lives in the Emirates itself and across Arabia and into South America and Southeast Asia too. But there's more to the novel concept of using camel antibodies than even the team had initially expected. As a totally new technique, it might offer a way to fight diseases that have been resistant to other treatments. I think, for example, to produce also antibodies against uh, really deadly diseases in humans, like HIV or polio or TB or malaria, the possibilities are there. And we have the uh, facilities now with this Austrian company. We have opened up a new laboratory over here at CVRL, and we have the camels. 
so I can easily in the future immunize a lot of camels against different deadly diseases and then produce antibodies. All of which means the work here in Dubai at the CVRL laboratory may have a dramatic impact on the drug and pharmaceutical industry around the globe, way beyond mere camels and snake bites. We have to spin the blood. But for now, the team is content to know they'll be saving lives as soon as their partners from Liverpool take the first batch of antivenom to the affiliated African hospitals. And this is it, the first ever example of an antivenom produced in this way. A few weeks from now, Dr. Robert Harrison will come here from the University of Liverpool, take away the complete box of these antivenoms and take them off to Lagos, where they have up to 10 snake bites a day. Hopefully, this is going to save somebody's life. Philip Hampshire reporting there. Now, this week, 1,500 men and women from the sporting world descended on Dubai, but they weren't the athletes, they were the people who organised and staged the world's top sporting events. And a big topic of discussion was money. Now, this part of the world uses its money to attract big events, but there are two that have never been held here, the Olympics and the FIFA World Cup. But that could change if Qatar wins its bid to host the FIFA World Cup in 2022. I spoke to the chairman of Qatar's bid, Sheikh Mohammed Thani, and asked him why he believes Qatar should be chosen. We are really presenting a FIFA World Cup bid that is so unique and so custom made to, to meet the requirements, not just of the Middle East, but of Qatar as well, given the size of Qatar. And it should be given to Qatar because it's time to be given to the Middle East. Now, you might have the money to do what you have set out to do, and you've got the support of the FIFA chairman, it appears, but Qatar is not a footballing nation. How will you fill the seats? That should not really affect the success of a World Cup uh, taking place. What affects the success of a World Cup taking place is government support and investment. And it's not just monetary investment, it's actual uh, emotional investment and the belief of a success of such a, such a tournament. But can you give me a feel for what a fan would see and be able to do in Qatar? If you come to Qatar, yes, we will promise, first of all, great, fantastic football, because we have provided the, the technology to do so. But most importantly, we are providing a new, rich culture, a new gateway to the Middle East for you to experience. From the sand dunes to the rich traditional uh, uh, settings of, of the locations to the breathtaking designs of the stadia, most of the fans from across the world have never been to the Middle East. And unfortunately, the depiction of the Middle East in, in the news isn't as, doesn't do justice to what we have to offer. But if a fan comes to Qatar and can fly to Dubai, Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, all within one hour, it means that a fan can experience the whole region, but at the same time have it within this footballing environment. And I think combining such a rich Middle Eastern culture with such a, a historic uh, uh, footballing culture, which is the FIFA World Cup, is the epitome of a, of a good time. But do you have the infrastructure that will be able to take in, absorb, accommodate all these people? It's actually part of the greater master plan for Qatar. We're developing a network that can incorporate all of the, 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 uh, the outermost regions uh, and cities of Qatar to bring them all uh, together. So what this means is we can take larger numbers of people and we, they, can tra they can transport much more uh, uh, fluidly to and from stadiums. So the size is actually our advantage here. It means less expenditures, but at the same time it means better experiences for fans. Will you make money? Of course. The majority of this infrastructure, such as the metro, the links, the Doha International Airport, which is already nearing completion, all of these infrastructures are already part of a greater plan. Now, as a bid, we're presenting designs for Stadia. What we're doing with these designs is we're creating something which we know it's financially sound and it will serve a legacy for the future. We will make up everything we spent and more. Sheikh Mohammed Al Thani speaking to me earlier. To Lebanon now, which has just hosted its first motor show in six years, thanks to renewed political stability there. Now, it's a welcome return for the world's car makers, but can they overcome the country's high taxes and persuade buyers to splash out on a new set of wheels? Well, in Beirut, Maha Barada has been finding out. This is the dream for so many in Lebanon. 
And while expensive luxury cars like these were the main attraction at this year's motor show, there were also plenty of cheaper, more cost-efficient cars on display. But behind the scenes, getting this event off the ground has been quite an achievement. Thanks to the renewed political stability in Lebanon, the show is back after a six-year absence. And it's an important market. Imported cars are one of the sources of income for the economy here. Last year, more than 32,000 cars were sold. That's up 78% on the previous years. 2009 was better by 48% by far. Uh, this was uh, a dream to us. Hopefully this year it will continue. I am uh, optimistic. A big advantage could, could uh, be if the, the government drops a little bit uh, the rate of the customs. And that's a key concern. Customs duties on imported cars can be as high as 50%. And there's also VAT and registration fees. But despite the extra costs, it hasn't affected Lebanon's love of cars. Neither did the global recession. While car markets around the world have been hit by the economic downturn, banks here say the car industry remains a major source of income, with the growing demand for car loans. This is the star of the show, a limited edition Maserati. There are only 12 of them around the world. This has already been sold for more than 200,000 pounds. While small and medium cars are considered the best sellers in the country, luxury and expensive cars have a recognizable market. Lebanon before the war and after the war is taking back its uh, serious, I can say, position in the world. And it has always been the pearl of the, of the Orient. And uh, luxury cars are part of it. While new and luxury imported cars grab the headlines, there is a tough competitor. Lebanon's streets are full of used car fares like this one, a place where you can pick up your dream car for a fraction of the price of a new one. It's uh, maybe about the type of the car, you know. You have some um, uh, well-known uh, brands that uh, you cannot find in uh, the new cars, you know, the, the, the price that you really can afford. Used car dealers have also cashed in on the drop in the euro-dollar exchange rate and falling car prices from the United States. But with high import duties, lots are still out of reach of many in Lebanon. Whether it is the high cost of a new car or that simply he's going green, this man has found the alternative. Maha Barada reporting from Beirut there. Well, we're going to take a short break now when we come back. Spinning a fortune from a fabric of gold, we meet the founder of a jewellery empire who tells us about the future of his business. And Abu Dhabi's making noise about music and art, but can it become the cultural centre of the Middle East? Welcome back to the programme. I'm Nima Abuate. Now, Dubai has long been known as a place to buy gold. Now, one of this city's largest retailers is looking to the downturn as a time to expand. It wants to go not only into neighboring Gulf countries, but also overseas. It's spending $200 million on opening up hundreds of stores in India. I spoke to the founder of the firm, Firuz Merchant, and asked him if now is the right time to go ahead with his plans. In the business, there is always right time. We need only the proper strategic, proper business plan, and proper business working style. But this is a time when consumers are tightening their belts. Gold sales specifically right. are down. Right. Why? Because whoever they invested the money in the gold, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, they made a good, good return and the money is a safe. That's why it says gold always, always help in the rainy days, in the bad time. So what you're saying is that people store their wealth in gold? Even though the, even though the good business, even though investor or rather the buyers, they are very happy and comfortable because where they invest the money, the value of the money is very important. Like example, somebody wants to spend the money, they want to know 
where I am spending the money and what is the value of my money, what is the value of my spending. But how important is the Gulf to your business in terms of business, revenue, profit? You are very right. The Gulf region is a very important for me because Gulf region is a bread and butter for me where I am getting the revenue and where I am getting the good return. It says you cannot change your bread and butter but you can put the jam with the different different flavor. When I started my business, I did not got any financial support from my family. During my honeymoon trip, I was visited Gold Souk. When I been to India after my trip, and I spoke to my father, I said, Dad, I want to go in the gold business. He laughed, very loudly laughed. And he said, are you crazy? Are you mad? What you are talking to? Last statement came from my father, sorry. If you want to go in this business, make your own decision. Don't expect anything or any financial support from me. But I always admire my father and mother who given me the blessings. And one, one word is more than enough for me and more than enough for me, money. He said, Allah give you blessings. Go and get success in your life and don't forget about the one message what he given me he said you have two eyes always keep in a mind to balance the both eyes together and do what you want if you have confidence certainly you will achieve your target achieve your goal Feroz merchant speaking to me earlier now it used to be Dubai that made all the headlines while its neighbor Abu Dhabi came across as more conservative but these days the capital's prominence is rising and as Katie Watson's been finding out Abu Dhabi's strategy is very different to Dubai's. It's rehearsal time for Tanarawen. The band is originally from Mali but has a global following playing as far afield as the UK and the US. For now though they're getting ready to play in Abu Dhabi. It's their first visit to the region but already band members can see it's quite different from back home. In Africa, music and musicians are important. In Africa, there's lots of music that's still not been discovered. There are lots of traditions that still remain. So music can have a role, stars can have a role. It's different here. It's a country that's very developed, so the most important thing is money. Money is king. Things like that are important here. But Abu Dhabi wants to show that money isn't the only thing that counts. It's hired WOMAD, which organises international music festivals, to help transform the city's beach into an open-air concert venue for the weekend. Money may be important, but Abu Dhabi isn't satisfied with making money just from its oil. It wants to promote itself as a cultural hub in the Middle East. That way it can attract international names as well as promoting local talent. Emiratis make up less than a fifth of the population of the United Arab Emirates, so encouraging local talent is a challenge. Wassel Safwan is an artist taking part in the WOMAD festival. He's mixed his background as an architect with his art and developed a movement called UAEism. He may be local, but to him, ideas are global. For me, I believe inventions and making ideas, it doesn't belong to a nationality or one region. When you make ideas and you invent something, and try to, about, to think about something, it's for everybody. That's how I look at it. Now, because I'm from here, I'm from this city, then it, be, it comes, this man came from this city, and I am local of this city. But all my ideas, I look at it as it's something for everybody. Abu Dhabi is also involved in much bigger cultural projects. I'm here on Sariat Island, just outside the city, and in a few years' time, this windswept island will house its very own Guggenheim and Louvre. But can big names and lots of money really rival places like Paris and New York? The huge amounts of money Abu Dhabi is investing in creating the cultural district on Sariat Island show it's serious about putting the city on the cultural map and it's adamant that its efforts will pay off in the years to come. Each city wants to brand herself as a cultural city. In Abu Dhabi, we have a very, very clear agenda, a very clear strategy that we are promoting arts and culture, and we are building up also education 
educational programs in arts and culture also to develop this society. It's not a show off. We, it's a very solid strategy and uh, it has a timing and it has targets for it. And what we are aiming and what you are seeing, it was a part of a five years strategy and a 10 years strategy. And you will see in the coming years what Abu Dhabi is trying to brand. <laughs> Abu Dhabi's efforts to transform itself from an oil-rich desert city to a tourist destination doesn't come without its challenges. It's a learning process for both sides. I think the challenge is, and we're experienced because we do it all over the world, is we have to respect local business practice and, and local culture. And I think if we walk through the door and say, this is how we do it, then I think we have a problem. So what we have to do is learn how to do business in, in, in this region. And, and hopefully they will also, and I think that is happening, learn some of our ways. And, and again, it, it has to be a partnership to work, but it is about us respecting local business practice. And it's not just business practices that need to be considered. Cultural sensitivities have to be respected too. Fireworks can only start once Friday prayers have finished. But once formalities are out of the way, the festival gets started. Abu Dhabi may not be an obvious place to come to for music, but a beachfront concert does have a certain appeal. Thank you. Katie Watson, having a good time in Abu Dhabi there. Well, our time is very nearly up. I do hope you've enjoyed our programme. Let's see how the region's main markets finish the week. And remember, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. Do email us your thoughts about the programme and any ideas for stories that you might have. And next week, we'll be at the region's largest travel fair. Is there an end in sight for the Middle East's recession-hit hotels and airlines? We'll be finding out. So until then, from me, Nima Abuwarde, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.